Up on the screen, you'll see a picture of our first president, plus some words. Would you read them with me, please? In God we trust. Every time you pull a dollar bill out, uh, on the back of it, right now at least, are the words, in God we trust. I was thinking about that this past week as I thought about what we should uh, share with you today and I began to pray and, and had confirmation from the Lord to uh, preach this message in God we trust because really I'm afraid that even most Christians do not trust in God. Now that's a side, sad commentary and I'll show you why in just a few minutes. But if you take your Bible and look there in the book of Psalm chapter 20 and let's read the verse together if you would please. Psalm 20 and verse 7. Would you read it out loud with me? Let's begin. Some trust in chariots and some in horses but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. You see, folks, a lot of times we'll take and put trust or what we call depend putting our dependability upon things that we can see visually. And sometimes because we don't see God in what we call a tangible way, then we seem to lack the trust. We can uh, reach for those things that uh, seem to be a sec at, at our access. For example, here it says a chariot. Now, a chariot's made of material, and it's usually a pretty strong uh, piece of uh, thing that they had back in the Old Testament, as well as in the New, and, and that's what they rode in to fight the battles. Today, we have our tanks and so forth and so on, and those are tangible things, and if we bring things up to date that we have today, I'm afraid we trust in them too much. For example, once again, pulling out the dollar bill, are we really trusting in the fact that this thing will stand up. It's only as good as that which is backed by. All right? It's only as good as that which is backed by. If we don't have, for example, the gold to back it, it's no good. It's no good at all. When we take and we put our trust in God, we know He is someone we can depend upon. He's the same, say it with me, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, we might not see him as tangible as I see this mic up here, but God still speaks. God can still be heard. God is almighty. God speaks in various ways. He has spoken various ways up through the ages. God has spoken through creation every day as you look out and you see the light come, uh, come on once again. That's God turning on the light. When you look at the various things in weather, uh, that's God speaking and possibly trying to get our attention. Though God does, ascend, uh, he sends the sunshine and rain for our benefit. Aren't you glad that we have rain to help our crops grow? Yes. I like to eat, don't you? I, I know it shows sometimes a little too much, but it's true. When you see the sunshine... The Bible says he lets the sun shine on the righteous as well as the unrighteous. Why? To let man know that he cares for him. And so when the writer here, Psalm David, wrote, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. He's the one that we can trust. He's the one that we can depend upon. God reigns, rules, overrules, and overrides. Now, I want you to take your Bible, and I want you to look at a verse found in Proverbs chapter number 21. Very quickly, look at verse 1. Of Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1, and then I want to have a word of prayer with you. Proverbs chapter number 21, look at verse number 1. You see, God can change a ruler, God can remove a ruler, and God can overrule a ruler. 
And you might ask the question, preacher, should we pray for our leadership of our world? And the answer is absolutely yes. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us in the book of Timothy, it says that we're to pray for all those uh, in authority, that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness. You and I have that responsibility. Now, look here at Proverbs chapter 21, and look at verse 1, and let's read together. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, as the rivers of water. He turneth it whithsoever he will. You see, the greatest responsibility in America is not in the White House, it's in the church house. And that is that you and I need to pray. So would you join with me in prayer right now, praying not only for this service, but praying for America. Our Father, we bow before you this morning, the great and mighty God, one that ruleth all things, brings all things about for his good pleasure and for our good. We call upon you today and we ask you to look down upon America and that, Lord, that once again, that people would turn to you and look to you as the one to depend upon. And I pray that our country will turn back to you. Maybe it hasn't because we as Christians have not made supplication the way Timothy uh, gives us here. That we ought to pray in, in supplication and prayer, making our requests may known unto you concerning our nation, concerning our leaders. I pray today, Lord, that you'd touch each one of us as we look at this principle of in God we trust. Do we really trust you the way we should? Or are we putting our confidence, our dependency upon those things that we can touch in a tangible way or see in a, in a physical way? May we see you as the one that's upholding all things by the right hand of your power. And Lord, I pray you would touch each person here today and let our hearts be open and receptive to the things that you show us and then let us respond accordingly. May your will be done in this hour, Lord, and we'll give you the praise, we'll give you the thanks, and we'll give you the honor and glory, both now and forever. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. I want to make a bold statement here very clearly this morning, and that is this. The blessing of God on your life and on my life is not, are you listening, is not dependent on your friends on your fame, or your feelings, but it's to depend upon the fact that God is still God. Amen. He's still the same. He still knows your needs. And by the way, there's nothing that comes into your life or my life that he can't deal with. Amen. Our problem is, are we really trusting him? Are we really dependent upon him? You see, there's a vast difference, folks. Would you listen to what I'm about to say? Because this will make all the difference in your life and my life. There's a vast difference between belief and trust. Let me illustrate. This chair this morning, you can look at it. You can touch it. Uh, you that have the capability of knowing uh, a little bit about materials and the understanding how things are shaped and, and the, the, the ability to understand how this chair came to be made so you and I could sit on it. You see, if this, uh, the, if this chair was not made proportionally in regards to the ability to hold, it, hold you up, then it would be no good. Reminds me of the story of the Patriot. How many of you have ever seen the Patriot, the movie The Patriot? If you remember that he kept making chairs, but he could never get one that would hold, up, hold him up. That chair... If it's not made in regards to the ability to hold anything up, it's really not good for anything. You may believe it holds you up, but it may not. Now this chair was made in its construction, and you and I believe that will hold us up, right? How many of you believe it will hold you up? Raise your hand. All right, let's put you to the test. Okay, Brother Bub, come on up here this morning. Do you, really, you said you believe this chair will hold you up, right? 
Or he didn't. <laughs> Sit back down. <laughs> Tom, did you raise your hand? No, you don't believe it'll hold you up either. Man, we got a bunch of unbelievers. Please get out of here, all right? <laughs> Come on up here, Fred. I know you believe it. You see, there's a difference between believing and trusting. Brother, Brother Fred, you believe this chair will hold you up. Is that right? Yes, Would you touch that chair? Come on up here. I'll, let, I'll help you. Now, I want you to just touch that chair. All right? Now, Brother Fred, do you, by touching that chair, do you believe that chair will hold you up? Yes, I believe it. Would you look at those materials real good in that chair? Do you believe that chair will hold you up? Yes, I believe that will hold me up. All right, do you really believe that chair will hold you up? Yes. I don't believe you do. I do. I believe, I believe it does. I'm going to sit down there. Oh, now, hey, let's give him a real hand, all right? You see, here's the point I'm trying to get across to you. Come on, Brother Fred, I'll help you back down here if you trust me. The vast difference between belief and trust is the principle of action. It's moving beyond the, the knowledge or the ascent of, uh, of the emotions of thought and it's actually putting myself into the position of resting in that chair. You see, the book of James has something to say that I think is very important for you and I to take into consideration. That is, the Bible says in James 2.19, matter of fact, let's all turn there. Well, I'm putting this chair back. James chapter number 2. Now, I want you to look down at verse number 19, if you would, please. James chapter 2, verse 19. Please get there. And I want you to read it out loud with me because this is a very important principle in regards to what I'm talking about this morning. In God, we trust. Would you say that with me again? In God, we trust. Now, you're in James chapter number 2. Read verse number 19 with me, if you would, please. Here we go. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith, say it with me, without works is what? Dead. When you and I put action into something, that, that, takes and validates the principle of that belief. You move from the principle of belief into the area of actually trusting in that which you say verbally that you believe in. You see, there's a lot of people that I meet every week knocking on doors and I ask them, do you believe in God? Oh yes, they believe in God, but they don't trust in God. There's a vast difference. Many of you may believe this morning that God sent his son to die upon the cross for your sins, but are you trusting in it? You may believe God answers prayer, but do you believe you can trust God to answer prayer? There's a vast difference. And God wants us to trust him. He wants us to depend upon him. On the face of our money, as I lifted it up a while ago, and I can't lift it up anymore, I gave it to missions. But on there it says, in God we trust. And I was reading this past week that a few years ago, the use of those words on our currency was challenged in court. And the article went on to say the case reached the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in Rich Richmond, Virginia, where the court ruled that the words could remain on the facade of a government building in Lexington, North Carolina. And that was good. But what you want to do is listen to what Judge Robert King's ruling on that matter came out to be. And here's what he said. The Fourth Circuit has therefore characterized the phrase, in God we trust, when used as the national motto on coins and currency as a patriotic and ceremonial motto, with no, are you listening? With no theological or ritualistic impact whatsoever. Now, what was he saying? 
Here's what he was saying. He was saying those four words in God we trust has no more meaning than if we had in Mickey Mouse we trust. But the real question is, do the words in God we trust mean anything of substance to you personally because you've moved beyond the verbal and the intellectual uh, thought into an actual action to prove that you trust God? I'm asking you that question this morning. So what does it mean to trust God? Trusting God is first a matter of looking away from everything else and looking to Him. You say, prove that, preacher. We'll take your Bible, and let's turn over to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. And we're going to look at two verses here in this chapter. Hebrews chapter 12, very quickly. Trusting God is a matter of looking away from everything else and trusting only in what he said he would do. Hebrews chapter 12, look there if you would please. Look at verse 2 to begin with. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, read it with me, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. That means when you're really trusting God in regards to Jesus Christ, and when he died upon that cross for your sins, you're personally applying that to your life. You're calling upon the name of the Lord, as the book of Romans chapter 10 says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be what? Saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. The heart is that part of you that moves beyond the mental ascent and makes it applicable in your own personal life. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. See? For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession made unto salvation. For whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And here is the key, here's the secret to make that applicable to your life and sit down in the chair and that's this for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what that is moving beyond the mental ascent of belief and putting it into action as a trust for your own personal life and I want to ask you this morning have you done that because that will be the difference are you listening that will make the difference between either going to heaven or going to hell and all God's people said. Amen. You see, trusting him means looking away from everything else. You're not dependent upon grandma and grandpa's prayers. You're dependent upon Jesus Christ. You're not dependent upon the fact that you got baptized, though you ought to get baptized after you're saved. You're dependent upon Jesus Christ. You're not dependent upon the fact that you uh, are a good person because the Bible says there's none good, there's none righteous, no, not one. That's why you have to believe on him, for with a heart man believeth unto righteous. So it's looking away from everything else, and it's trusting only in Jesus Christ. Look at that second verse there in verse 15. Looking diligently lest any man fail of the what? Grace of God. You see, for by grace... Are you, come on, quote it with me. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, you what that works qualify, uh, is indicating? Take, a, take and at the very top, put works, and then anything that you do in your life, that's a work. That will not save you. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, John 14, 6. Let me come to a second thought here very quickly. Trusting God is a matter of knowledge. 
You see, the great man Solomon grasped the reality of this when he wrote down the verse there in Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7. He says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Knowledge. I want to ask you today. Do you really fear God? Now, I'm not talking about that which is shaking your boots, you know, because you might, uh, you know, be afraid of something. The word fear there means having a reverence or due respect for what God has said and what God has done, and you personally are going to accept that. The knowledge of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. What is wisdom? Wisdom is knowing what's right to do and doing it. The fool, he knows what's right to do, but he doesn't do it. That's why he's called a fool. God wants you to understand something here this morning. That is, trusting God is a matter of knowledge. You're not doing something without a mental ascent. You have to do that because the mental moves to the will. It's part of that aspect that God says that we are not only a body, but we're a soul and we're a spirit. And the spirit is part of the emotions. It's part of the decision maker of an individual that we call in the Bible the heart. For with the heart, when we move with the heart. Now, a lot of us are like this. Danny, get up. I will. No, I had the knowledge how to get up. Responding would be because of my will to get up. You see, that's the same way in regards to believing God. It's moving beyond the fact that I say an I will to a true action of getting up. The action is the exercise of the will. And trusting God is a matter of knowledge. In 1 John chapter 5, listen to this. These things have are written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, everybody here this morning, if you believe on the name of the Son of God, would you lift your hand? All right? In order for you to really believe on the name of the Son of God, you call upon him and ask him to apply to your life that which he did. Now, John said here, he says, look, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. In other words, he's saying now, move beyond mental ascent and make it applicable through action. And then he goes on to say, and this is a confidence that we have in him, and here's the action, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. You see, trusting him has to have, yes, knowledge, but it's moving beyond the mental ascent into the area of action. For example, if a young man says, I really believe in protecting our country. Now, I can say that all he wants, Brother Jim, but in order for him to really get into action, he joins the armed services, our forces. That's when he gets into action because he is joining in. Well, listen. That's true with our lives, regardless of whether it be for salvation or whether it be for any other area of the Christian life. It's moving beyond the verbal and the mental ascent into the area of trusting him because based upon the knowledge that we have. How many of you believe that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture and he, he was raised again the third day? Raise your hand and wave it at me. Yes. But moving beyond that, it's true salvation when you get into action. Let me come to a third thing by having you to turn to the book of Proverbs chapter 3. Would you turn that very quickly? 
Proverbs chapter 3, and I want you to look at verse 5 and 6. Most of you know it, but I want you to turn there anyway, because this is a valuable thought that I want you to get a hold of this morning. Trusting God is a matter of His guiding our lives. We may say, yes, I can trust God to guide my life, but wait a minute. It's moving beyond the mental and the knowledge ascent into an actual action. Are you really trusting God every day in your life? Well, see, it means letting him guide your life. That means, God, I'm turning loose of my will and I'm going to say, your will be done. That's the key. Look here, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Let's read it together. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Are you trusting the Lord? You say, well, sure I do. Are you asking him to direct in all your ways? Are you acknowledging God in every decision, every choice that you have? Now let me stop right there and look up here very carefully. If I take and I am letting and acknowledging him and I'm trusting him in directing my life and guiding my life, that means I will not take and go contrary to the map. True or false? This is the book that he gives us as instruction. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. If you and I are really trusting God, if God says it, whether I believe it, I trust him. Amen. I'm going to do it his way. Folks, this is the book of life. This is the book that will never lead you in the wrong direction. True or false? God has given it to us that we don't have to make mistakes. We don't have to come up with the problem coming short. We can get the problem solved. Because God said it. And whether I believe it or not, it's so. This book is for you and me. And we need to trust it. And when a nation turns its back on God, how can we expect to be guided in the right way of living, protection, and all the rest of life? If you go back to the Old Testament, there we have in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 33, a very important story of comparison. We have two men. One of the men's names was, and you can read this later if you want to look back there, if you're writing notes in 2 Chronicles chapter number 33. We have a man by the name of Hezekiah. And many of you are familiar with that name. And Hezekiah was a God-fearing king who brought about what we would call in our day and time reformation to the people of Israel and their lives. He did that which was right in God's eyes. And matter of fact, God extended his life 15 years. That's important. But what happened was this. Like in any age, we have a, a will that we can choose right from wrong. Though we might teach our children, though our parents would have taught us, we still have a will to do our own thing. Uh, we find in that same location, his son, by the name of Manasseh, was an evil ruler. He had watched his father walk with God, live according to the scriptures, yet we find that he chose not to trust God. Oh, he believed in God, but he didn't trust him. He did not depend upon God, and because of that, his life became evil. He chose that which is wrong. And God had to bring judgment upon him. In that same location, you'll find out that Manasseh worshipped false gods, even to the point of sacrificing his own sons up in fire. Why? Because he said he believed, but he really wasn't trusting. There's a vast difference. You see, this story 
of these two men, Hezekiah and Manasseh, illustrates to you and me a very important principle, and that is how tolerant God really is. God has been tolerant with America. But I still say, let's pray for America. We still have the greatest nation upon the face of the earth. Pray for it. Support the right things. By the way, speak up when you ought to speak up. This morning, if I had walked outside of the building here and somebody was burning the flag, you'd see your preacher get in one of the biggest fights you've ever seen. I'm a flag-waving American. And because of the blood that's been shed, even in recent years and days, by our men in the armed services, we ought to stand up for them. Amen. We ought to do what's right. And you and I need to pray for our nation. But we need to trust God to take and change America. And this United States of America was founded on biblical principles to guide our country. Many of our leaders even today say they believe God, but they're not trusting God. But thank God for our forefathers, those who did. I wish I would have brought some of my things in that Benjamin Franklin and uh, Adams and some of the others that they wrote in regards to our country. George Washington, go back and study his life. He believed in God. He believed in Bible. By the way, he not only believed in God, he trusted God. How many of you know this morning his nickname? George Washington's nickname. Do you know? Georgie. No. <laughs> Georgie. <laughs> Old bulletproof. Read it in history. God took care of him. He should have been dead. And the Indians told him he should have been dead. But God spared his life. You see, our forefathers not only believed in God, they trusted God. We need a nation like that today. We need leaders like that today that will stand up unashamedly and say, I believe in one God, the Heavenly Father. We need that once again because that's what it means in God we trust. You see, there's a man in the Old Testament by the name of Noah. Noah had never seen it rain before. Matter of fact, when God told him, he says, it's going to rain 40 days and 40 nights, Noah. He says, what is rain? Because everything was watered from beneath. But Noah not only believed God, he trusted God. And he stepped out and he built that ark strictly on the principle that God said, I want you to do it. And he followed it to a T in regards to the dimensions that God had given him. Why? He listened to God and then he obeyed God. I was reading a story and I'll close with this this morning in regards to this matter of trusting God. And I want you, before I do, I want you to take your Bible and I want you to go back over. And I want you to look at Proverbs chapter 28 verse 25 with me if you would. Proverbs chapter 28, look down there if you would at verse number 25. If we as a nation and we as a people are going to have God's blessings once again, we've got to move beyond the principle of belief and we've got to trust God once again. This nation was the greatest blessed nation of all the nations of the earth. Now look at verse 25 there, if you would, please. He that is of a proud heart, read it with me, stirreth up strife. Could that be what has happened with America? We have become so haughty. Now, there's nothing wrong being proud with the fact of God's blessings on our nation. 
But when we get to the place of being haughty and think that we can do things on our own self rather than depend upon God, we've got problems. Look at the second part of the verse, if you would please. But he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made what? You say, preacher, I don't want to be made fat. And I agree, I don't want to be that way too. He's not talking about that. He's talking about being prosperous. God blessed America and prospered it because America and his people trusted in God. They tell me, I don't know, maybe some of you elderly men. Any men, any of our men here fight uh, in, uh, back in the old wars like World War II? Anybody here? Brother Bill, you understand about what I'm probably going to tell you because you experienced it probably or knew about it in a close relationship. They tell us, at least I've read it, one of the most dangerous jobs pertaining to fatality rates in World War II was being a pilot on an aircraft carrier. Now here's the reason why. The problem was trying to land on this short little airstrip that was, that was traveling, and you understand what I'm saying, you're traveling away from you. I mean, because that ship would go up and down, maybe even 15 feet, and toss to and fro, and here these aircraft uh, pilots were trying to land on that strip. And the information went on to say sometimes there would be those waves that would toss the ship from side to side. And on the tail end of the plane was what they called a tail hook. Am I right so far? That was to catch, a, that had a little water that would stretch across the ship that would make the ship, after it was caught, to stop. And if you didn't catch that wire, then you were in for a long day. Amen. So the key to land on this aircraft, aircraft carrier was to have total, are you listening to me? Was to have total confidence in your landing officer. And the article went on to say... He would stand there, and I don't understand this because I've never seen it. He would hold up some things called or look like uh, tennis rackets. And he would guide the, uh, the aircraft safely aboard that ship. He was called the LSO. And if the LSO would tell you to pull up... You were coming in too low, then you would pull up. If you were coming in too fast, he would slow you down. And when you came close, if you were not right, he would wave you off to fly around and try it again. But if you were okay, then he would give the sign to cut everything off. And that meant that you were not to touch anything again till the plane hit the ship. Of course, that's not like today because of all the instruments and so forth and uh, the updated equipment of the aircraft. But it was back in those days. So you had to have complete trust in the LSO to get you to land safely. May I say this to you this morning? God is our LSO, and if you are to land safely on heaven's portals of glory, land strip, you've got to trust him. And friend, this might be your last trip. This may be your last opportunity to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. This may be your last time, Christian, to follow God's guidance in your life before you leave this life. You see, every time that I stand in front of a group of people at a funeral service, this reminds me, it may be my last time that I'll have an opportunity to present the gospel. I did that this week. And it seems to be becoming more common 
never has before. You see, the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, but after that, the judgment. I want to ask you, are you trusting Christ with your life for salvation? Are you trusting God day by day to live this life successfully? God wants you to pay close attention. And I'll, I'm not going to have you turn there. I want you to listen very attentively. And I've read this verse many times from this pulpit. But in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, it says this. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein do a night, day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. The greatest success you could ever have is to, number one, be saved. Number two is living your life, trusting what God has given in this book that God can say one of these days, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Would you pray with me? With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, I would like for you to search your heart and ask yourself, am I just believing in God? Am I just believing that Christ died upon the cross? Or am I really trusting in what he did upon the cross for me and shedding his blood to pay for my sins? Have I personally sat down in the chair? And then I'd like to ask you, Christian, are you really trusting God from day to day in this life? Because if you are, you're letting this book guide you. You're dependent upon, you're looking away from everything else and you're looking to him in regards to your life. I don't know what your need is this morning, teenager, mom, dad, but I know one thing. We're in this service here today to hear what God has to say about trusting him. And there's an altar here and there's a pew here. God wants you to respond to him. Showing your trust to him. If God's spoken to your heart this morning, if God's been speaking to your heart and dealing with you in a particular area of your life, why don't you come? It could be salvation that you need this morning. It could be rededication of life. It could be obedience to his will in regards to whatever the obedient area is. Or maybe surrender. Say, Lord, I want to serve you. I want to be the person you want me to be. And Brother Robert's going to be standing up here in the front in just a few seconds. And Dr. Collins is going to be leading us in an invitation as we do every Sunday morning. But folks, let's let this Sunday morning be different. Let's move beyond the principle of belief. And let's move into the area of trust. Would you do that? Stand with me, please. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning, and I want to ask you to take, during this invitation, first of all, speak to my heart. Whatever you'd have for my life, I want you to speak to me and show me. I pray for every person here this morning that has a decision they need to make. May they not sit back, but may they respond and be obedient to you. Regardless of our age, may we get up, may we respond and be obedient to you. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Dr. Collins, what are we singing this morning? 488. If you need your hymn books, God speaking to your heart, I encourage you to leave to the nearest hour and come and let God have his way in your life. We'll have a counselor talk with you. Meet Brother Robert up here and he'll have someone to help you. You come right now. Oh.